Hello, and welcome to episode 12 of Sarastro's Star Wars Legion painting series. In this episode, we're going to paint Boba Fett from Fantasy Flight Games' Star Wars Legion. Boba Fett is an incredibly rewarding miniature to paint, with a variety of interesting colours, battle damage, and the option to have some fun with a little object source lighting. I've chosen to match the look of the outfit from Return of the Jedi, and as usual with the hero figures, I'm going to employ a range of techniques to create a look that I feel does justice to the character. Along the way, I'll be sharing both a fairly quick and simple approach to painting the figure, alongside a range of more advanced optional touches you may wish to explore. Let's take a look at the painting stages. I'm going to prepare the figure using a dark coloured primer, followed with some zenithal highlights sprayed from above, and I'll be showing two approaches to achieving this look depending on whether you're using an airbrush or spray cans. We'll then apply the base colours, and I'll be using a build-up of thin layers for the green armour to create some subtle variations of light and shade. Next we'll be using two simple shades to tie the colours together and bring some definition to the creases and shadows. In the highlighting stage, I'm going to focus on brightening up the areas of the figure where I want to create the impression of light being given off from the flames of the jetpack. For the finishing touches, I'll be adding plenty of battle damage before painting the flames and adding some object source lighting to the surrounding areas. I'll also be adding some additional optional reflections and colour modulation for the helmet, and I've chosen to have some fun creating a simple scorched earth effect for the base. Let's begin. Assembly of the miniature is very simple. The only decision to make is which parts of the model to glue now, and which to glue later on. I've chosen to glue the legs, body, arms, and jetpack flames, but we'll be dry fitting the head and the jetpack itself for the time being. I'm also shaving the end of a skewer to create a temporary handle to mount the figure whilst painting. I'm now going to prime two copies of the model to show how we can achieve some effective zenithal highlights both with and without an airbrush. Using my standard airbrush approach as detailed in previous episodes, I'm first priming the figure in black. I'm then following this with a mid-tone grey, in this case cold grey, which I'm applying from above and down to a roughly 45 degree angle all around the figure. This nicely brightens up all of the upturned surfaces of the model, which we'd expect to catch the most light, meaning we can utilise some thin base colours later on to achieve some quick and easy highlights. I'm now strengthening these highlights with some pure white applied directly from above. When using a spray can, it's important to be aware that the paint comes out a lot thicker and faster than with an airbrush, and spraying three separate tones onto the model runs the risk of losing detail. Priming in black followed with a spray of white from above is one option, but can lead to quite a grainy and abrupt transition from the black to the white. I'm going to suggest priming with a mid-tone grey instead, such as Mechanica's Standard Grey, which we can shade down with a black wash in a moment. You can see I'm sweeping the spray across the figure to achieve my coverage without overspraying the miniature. Once dry, I'm going to shade the entire model with Null Oil. This just brings some depth to the recesses that was lacking due to our not priming initially with black. Finally, I'm going to provide the zenithal highlights from above using Tamiya's Fine White Surface Primer. I'm once again sweeping the can across the miniature, and this can be applied in a couple of passes to build up the brightness to a strong pure white. We can see that although the airbrushed figure on the left has a slightly smoother finish, both approaches have given us a strong level of contrast that we can exploit when applying our base colours in a moment. If you'd rather prime in a single colour however, I'd recommend priming with a light grey or white. Let's now begin adding some colour. I'm going to first paint Boba Fett and then the jetpack separately later on, and I'm going to begin by painting the jumpsuit using deck tan. The simple approach here would be to paint the whole thing this one colour, and that would be fine. 
If you want to create a greater sense of volume, you could do what I'm doing and mix in some black for the more shadowed parts of the figure. Because I'm using a dry palette and I'm planning to have quite a long session, I'm going to be mixing a little retarder into my main colours to extend the drying time, along with some water as usual. Here on the left I've got my pure deck tan, and next to that I've got a couple of darker tones ready for the shadows. I'm starting with a pure deck tan which I'm applying to the frontal parts of the legs. I'm then going a little darker for the lower, more shadowed portions of the leg. I'm now using the darkest tone for the feet. The ankle straps on the outfit are actually a fair bit lighter however, so I'm painting them with the pure deck tan. I'm now moving on to the other leg and the rest of the jumpsuit. I'm using pure deck tan for most of the upper body, with a little of the darker tone for areas like beneath the arms. Next I'm using Vallejo's Japanese uniform for the yellow shoulder and knee pads. This may need a couple of layers. For the green armour, I'm using retractive green mixed with just a little flat blue. For this shadowed piece of armour, I'm using a fairly standard base coat consistency. For the chest plate and helmet, however, I'm thinning the paint down to the consistency of a heavy glaze, which I'm going to apply in a few thin layers. It's important to unload some of the paint before doing this to avoid flooding the miniature. And here on the chest I'm pulling the pigments down and to the edges to begin creating some subtle gradations of tone. I'm now doing the same for the helmet where I want to pull the paint down away from the top, leaving a soft rounded area of highlight. And here I'm painting the lower part of the helmet. We can then build the tone up further with some additional layers, letting the paint dry in between each one. This may seem more arduous than providing a single, more solid base coat, but is actually quite an easy way to achieve some subtle gradations of tone, and is certainly easier than trying to achieve a similar look by building up layers of highlight later on, which can be quite troublesome for smooth, flat areas like we have here. There are a couple of other pieces of the green armour we can see underneath the neck, and also around the back. It's worth remembering that we'll be adding plenty of battle damage here later on, so I wouldn't worry too much about some unevenness or the occasional tide mark.
It's an odd detail that would be fine to ignore, but the green at the lower back of the helmet is actually a more vibrant tone, so I'm mixing in some deep green to achieve a similar look. I'd now like to push the contrast on the armour further by darkening the base colour with some black green. You'll sometimes see me feathering the edges of the transitions with a damp brush. I'm now mixing some black with some black green and using this to paint the darker, arch-like sections of the helmet beneath the eyes. I'm also using this to give the depth on the armour one last push. Now that I'm happy with the look of the green armour, we can move on to the remaining areas of the figure. For the red sections of the outfit, I'm using Vallejo's Burnt Red, once again mixed with just a little flat blue. I'm applying this in a single layer and taking care to avoid the silver metal detailing on the wrists and the stock of the carbine rifle. Before painting the red parts of the helmet, I'm first going to paint the visor with some pure black. I've also chosen to paint on some optional reflections, starting with a mid-tone grey. I'm now adding some additional white. and a final hit of pure white. I'm now continuing with the red. For the cape, which is a more yellowish green, I've chosen Elysian green for my main colour. I've also chosen to mix roughly equal parts of retractive green with black green to use for the darker sections which you can see me mixing here. I'm now painting the entire underside with a darker tone. I'm also painting the slightly shadowed middle band of the back of the cape with this. Whilst that's still wet, I'm now using the Elysian green to paint the lower portion of the cape, which I want to appear brightened by the flames of the jetpack, and the top upturned part of the cape, which would catch more natural light from above. The simple approach, however, would be to paint the entire back of the cloak with the Elysian green. Once dry, I'm going over one or two areas with the Elysian green.
Moving on to the belt, I'm mixing Monfang Brown with some black, which I'm applying in a couple of reasonably thin layers. I'm now mixing some black and dark sea blue and using this firstly to paint one of the braids of wookie fur we can see hanging over the right shoulder. I'm now using this somewhat thinly to paint the carbine rifle. This flows nicely into the recesses, meaning I won't have to apply any highlights here later on, although I will be adding some rusty weathering. For the remaining braid, I'm using Ushabdi Bone mixed with a little black. For all of the metal details on the outfit, I'm going to be freely mixing a range of grey tones using black and white, along with a little dark sea blue and some deck tan. However, you could use a simple metallic or metallic mix here instead if you like. An equal mix of Mechanica's standard grey and Stormhost silver for example would be fine. You can see I'm using mostly mid to light shades of grey, except for the eyepiece which appears to be quite dark. With that done, I'm now moving on to the jetpack and I'm starting by painting the yellow areas using Japanese uniform. And I'm returning to my burnt red mixed with a touch of flat blue for the areas of red. I'm now using deck tan for the two off-white strips we can see either side of the central panel. As usual, I like to touch up mistakes as I go along. I'm now mixing a range of greys using black, white and deck tan to paint the metalwork, but once again, a simple mix of something like Mechanicus Standard Grey and Stormhost Silver would also be fine. I'm being fairly rough in my application as the jetpack wants to have quite a worn and weathered appearance.
Here I'm using some white mixed with deck tan to add some of my brightest highlights. For the blue sections I'm using a roughly equal mix of dark sea blue and flat blue. With the base colours complete, we're ready to add some shade. I'm going to begin by shading the cloak with some neat Ethonian camo shade. This has a brownish tinge that matches the source material nicely. The only other shade I'm going to use is a 2 to 1 mix of Nuln Oil and Agrax Earthshade, thinned with an equal amount of Lamian Medium. I'm using this to shade the entire miniature apart from the cloak, chestplate and helmet. With that done, we're ready to add some highlights. I'm going to begin by brightening up select parts of the jumpsuit using deck tan. I'm focusing here on the upturned parts of the left leg as well as the pouches. I'm lightening this area of the torso to help boost the contrast between the jumpsuit and the chest plate. And here I'm brightening the pouch and back of the right leg which I imagine would catch a fair bit of light from the flames of the jetpack. I'm now adding a little white to give a final boost to some of the edges. The remaining parts of the figure really don't require much highlighting, as we'll be adding plenty of chips and battle damage in a moment that will override most of the edges anyway. However, I'm going to go ahead and add a few highlights to the areas of yellow by mixing some Uriel yellow and some white into the original Japanese uniform base tone. I'm going a little lighter still for the front edge of the knee pads. A 
I'm also adding a touch of white to the burnt red base tone for the sections of red armour. I've decided to boost the saturation of the red on the helmet by also mixing in a little Evil Sun Scarlet. I'm not going crazy here, but just wanted to subtly turn the helmet into more of a focal point. And here I'm also adding some white to the blue base tone we mixed earlier for the blue sections of the backpack, where I'm hitting all of the edges with the side of the brush tip. I'm now picking out a few highlights on the braiding by adding some white to my Ushabdi bone. And I'm also adding white to the Mornfang brown and black base tone we mixed for the belt earlier. Next I'm going to pave the way for some object source lighting on the back of the cape by firstly highlighting the lower portion with the original Elysian green. I'm now lightening this with the addition of some white in a few stages. This not only lightens the area but also desaturates it, making it easier to tint with some more fiery tones in a moment. With the highlights complete, we're ready to add some finishing touches. Before adding the weathering, I'm going to paint the row of short stripes on the side of Boba Fett's helmet with a mix of burnt red and Uriel yellow. These don't need to be immaculately neat or even complete, as we'll be adding some battle damage on top in a moment. I'm now going to begin building up the battle damage on Boba Fett's armour. A range of colours were used on the original outfit to do this, including some pale green on the chest plate, which I'm creating here by mixing some white and retractive green. There are also some scratches that appear in yellow, so here I'm using some Japanese uniform mixed with a touch of white. I'm now overlaying some damage using a mid-tone grey. We naturally want to focus a lot of this damage onto the edges of the form, which also serves the function of an edge highlight. And I'm now moving onto the helmet and other areas of the model.
I'm now using quite a pale grey. Finally, I'm mixing some Stormhost Silver with some white. Now that I'm happy with the armour, I'm going to use some red rust to weather the rifle. I'm thinning this with a little water and simply applying it quite roughly to most of the weapon. I'm now adding a second application to increase the intensity. With that done, I'm now going to paint the flames of the jetpack, and I'm starting by providing an undercoat of pure white. I'm then going to use a trilogy of the Vallejo fluorescent paints to colour the flames. I'm starting with the yellow and painting most of the flames but leaving a little of the pure white at the base. I'm now mixing the orange and magenta and applying this to the lower part of each flame. These are somewhat translucent paints, especially when thinned, which means we can build up the saturation in a couple of layers. Finally, I'm using some of the pure magenta for the flame tips. I'm now checking to judge which parts of the figure I'd like to apply some object source lighting to, which of course is entirely optional. I'm starting with a cloak and I'm simply brushing on some of the thinned fluorescent orange. You can see that I'm pulling the pigments down towards the lower end of the cloak, which is closest to the flames. I'm building the tone up in a couple of layers. I'm now applying this to the nearby pouch and the right leg. Because we already boosted the brightness of these areas earlier, the orange will naturally stand out quite nicely. I'm now checking to see how things look and I've decided to create some even sharper highlights on the lower cloak by mixing some white with the fluorescent orange.
and here I'm glazing on a little of the pure orange. I'm now using the orange to also tint some of the highlights on the jetpack. And I'm also taking the orange a little further round the side of the right leg. Next I've chosen to create a prominent orange highlight on the right side of the helmet, so we'll begin by mixing white into some retractive green to create a soft white highlight initially, which I'll then glaze the orange onto in a moment. I'm now increasing the level of white towards the centre of the highlight. I'm also creating a more diffuse secondary highlight towards the rear left of the helmet. Here I'm using some pure white both for the main reflection and also some of the surrounding edges. And I'm now applying a couple of thin layers of the fluorescent orange. Needless to say, this is a completely optional touch, but one that I feel adds a nice bit of drama and also helps to make the face more of a focal point. To add some further interest as well as some contrast against the warmth of the orange, I'm now going to glaze some light turquoise onto the opposite side of the helmet. I'm also glazing this down the right side of the chest armour. And I've chosen to glaze some very thin Uriel yellow to the upper half of the chest. These additional colours are just to add a little extra nuance and variety. I'm now reworking a few of the scratches that have become overtinted with colour. To sharpen the contrast of the face area, I'm now mixing some black with some black green, and using this to more strongly define the upper join between the red and green sections of the helmet. With that done, I'm now gluing the head into place, as well as the rocket pack. Before moving on to the base, there's one final detail I've chosen to add, which is the emblem we can see on the chest. For that, I'm first drawing in a circular background using a mix of flat blue with some black and white to create a blue-grey tone. I usually find when drawing shapes like this that it's best to start small, then gradually increase the size. I'm now using a pale grey to approximate the symbol on top. Given the scale we're working at, this just means applying a thin diagonal stroke across the centre, and a couple of smaller touches either side. And here I'm doing a little tidying with the blue-grey, before spraying the figure with the protective matte spray. I'm now dry-fitting the flight stand to the figure, before gluing it to the base aiming to keep Boba Fett himself in the centre. We can now add some texture to the base, and I'm taking my usual approach as detailed in the earlier episodes. This means I'm applying a basing paste, followed with a green shade, using a mix of Athonian camo shade and Beale Tan Green. 
I'm now applying some grit and turf, and in particular, I'm going to lay down a patch of Army Painter's black battleground to the rear of the base, where I want to create the impression of some scorched earth. Once dry, I've chosen to darken the entire base using Agrax Earthshade thinned with a little Lamian medium. I'm doing this mostly to prevent the green of the turf from visually competing with the green of Boba Fett's armour. I'm also now applying some neat null oil to the rear of the base, where I want the ground to appear burnt. Once that's dry, we can then dab on some pure white to begin creating the impression of some glowing rocks and embers on the ground. I'm then applying some of the fluorescent orange and magenta mix on top. I'm now going to add some foliage, including some fine leaf foliage by Woodland Scenics, which I'd like to appear slightly barren and jarred. I like to fix this in place by firstly drilling a hole, and then gluing it in with some superglue. I'm now adding some silfloor grass. And I've chosen to burn the ends off some of the foliage. I'm now gluing the figure to the stand, and I'm applying a few final highlights and retouches. And this completes Boba Fett. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification icon to ensure you don't miss future episodes. Please note you'll find a full list of paints and brushes used in the video description below where you can also find links to where I can be reached on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and Spotify. Join me again soon as we continue painting miniatures from Star Wars Legion. Happy painting!